Let's pray. Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, life is like a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. Now we come to this moment in the life of the college where the hopes, dreams, and prayers of students, parents, and yes, even the dreams of faculty and staff are answered. We are mindful of the power of dreams to change lives, to create channels of possibility, to move mountains, and to make a way out of no way. The way for us is not always clear, O oh Lord. Our future is not always sure. We have no way of knowing when the storm is over. We have no way of knowing when the truth of whatever is being said has been spoken. We just have to wait to see what happens after the last word has been uttered. Thanks be to God for the gift of dreams. Let it not be said that dreams of Wabash College are too small for the wants of our nation. Let it not be said that the dreams of our graduates are too narrow for the global community. Oh Lord, please let it not be said that the dreams of the parents, alumni, and friends gathered here at this moment are too weak for peace, too weak for justice, and too narrow for Black Lives Matters. Let it be dreams that are daring dreams. For if we dare to dream, we will win in the name of all of those for whom dreams are sacred. In the name of all that is good, just, and beautiful, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome to the 178th commencement at Wabash College. Our spirits shine brightly in pride for the men of the class of 2016 who embody the highest ideals of our gentlemen's rule, who are joined here today by our special guests on the platform and by trustees, faculty, family members from near and far, and all who love Wabash. But today's focus is on you, the 195 men who make up the class of 2016. Gentlemen, you have taken on the rigors of this great college and have thrived under the challenge of living and learning at Wabash. You have emerged stronger for your perseverance, grit, and courage. You have thrived in this environment of freedom and responsibility, and you have responded with maturity and commitment. You have been teachers just as you have been learners, and you have provided a model for all of us here today of the great value of civil discourse in our democratic society. Your hard work has paid off. You leave this hallowed place to pursue advanced degrees in science and the humanities at exceptional universities, excellent firms, and to exciting opportunities to serve our country and as teachers in our public schools. You are an impressive class and have demonstrated determination in achieving the mission of our great college. Men of the class of 2016, we are proud of you today. And in our pride, we know that you are prepared to live lives of purpose and meaning. You have lived up to this college's lofty mission, and today you will leave this alma mater prepared to think critically, use judgment, lead, and live a life for others. In keeping with our long-standing Wabash tradition, the only speakers this afternoon will be representatives of the senior class. Our first speaker is Nathaniel Brighton Bodie, who has double majored in psychology and Spanish. A member of Phi Delta Theta, 
he received the Dean Stevens Award, which is to a junior who exhibits broad intellectual and personal interests, high moral courage, and concern for others. Nathan is the son of Mark and Patricia Bodie of Greenfield, Indiana. Our second speaker is Samuel Thomas Vaught, who majored in religion, minored in classics, and earned distinction on his comprehensive exams. He was a member of Student Senate, participated in the Wabash Theater production of Guys and Dolls, and served as president of the Glee Club. Sam received the Community Service Award, the Glee Club Senior Award, the John N. Mills Prize in Religion, the John N. Mills Fellowship in Religion, the Lewis Salter Memorial Award, and was inducted in Phi Beta Kappa. Sam is the son of Thomas and Deborah Vaught of Crawfordsville. Each young man will speak without further introduction. Please welcome Nathan Bodie and Samuel Vaught. Good afternoon, Wabash. Uh, before we get started, an announcement that I made my freshman year here, I will make again proudly today, uh, that as of about 3.30 a.m. this morning, the brothers of Phi Delta Theta are proud to announce that the senior bench is still painted fire engine red, instead of Theta Delta. So, Welcome to the 178th commencement ceremony of the college. That you are here today means that you are taking a part in something very special, joining the ranks of 184 years of excellence since Wabash's founding. And I am humbled and honored to have been asked to speak today. I would make a bet that four years ago, many members of the faculty and staff would not have guessed they'd be hearing a Fidel speak today. If we have learned one thing during our time here, it is that excellence and a good time are not mutually exclusive. Wabash has meant so many different things to me in four years. At first, it was a place far away from home. Now it feels like coming home. I have somersaulted across the mall. I have run laps around Mud Hollow. I have spent an evening with wonderful people, eating alcoholic jello out of a pan, playing Cards Against Humanity on the floor while celebrating the engagement of one of my best friends. Fittingly, Wabash, that was actually on our Dean of Students living room floor. <laughs> what a place and what a time I will cherish coming to an end. I had the exciting privilege of visiting Muncie, Indiana last weekend to watch my twin sister graduate from Ball State University with her degree in anthropology. Ball State's commencement ceremony reflected the structure that is common for most universities and featured a well done commencement speech from the recipient of the honorary degree. I believe it is a testament to Wabash's vision and understanding of its students that we experience a commencement like this with seniors at the podium. While today is a special day for all of us, proud parents, professors, and alumni alike, I will speak today pri er, primarily to my fellow graduates. While there have been allegations that I am up here simply to tow the party line, I can assure you that there has been no censoring or review of this speech. I could say anything I want, actually. I could read you a haiku about Jaeger bombs, but that's crazy talk. To be honest, the first draft of this speech was the most macabre, serious, and gloomy piece of work I've written during my time here, and I took a class over Nietzsche. <laughs> I wanted to somehow capture the feeling of sadness and loss that I get when I think about leaving this place, while managing to speak meaningfully on the experiences of each member of this class. However, unless you too are a gay Fidel in the Sphinx Club, and I highly doubt that you are, I'm sure that you and I have had vastly different experiences here on campus. However, since we entered the Wabash world together, each of us has shared what it means to be a Wabash man. We pulled all-nighters, we passed comps, we left our last bit of dignity at the cactus, and we have never known what it feels like to lose the bell. As I have moved through this final week on campus, the feeling of loss when I think about leaving Wabash has adjusted to excitement about the future, a feeling that my friend Sam Vaught has helped me define during our discussions about this speech. Although the administration has given me the liberty to say whatever I want in this time, I will offer just a few w words of wit and questionable wisdom before we finally walk under the arch. You all in the audience may be wondering what in the world this shrimpy kid on stage has to tell you about life. 
The funny thing is, I've been wondering the same thing. I am not the strongest nor fastest guy on campus. I am certainly not the smartest. And after two unsuccessful play auditions, I've discovered that maybe this face is meant for radio rather than the stage. <laughs> I think what I have done right on campus, however, has been an approach to my time here with genuine passion and a lot of it. I think I have told anyone with a pulse that I'm a Wabash man since my junior year of high school, a sentiment I am still proud to share today. If I am known for, on campus for anything, it's probably finding any excuse that I can to dress like an idiot, and that includes the entirety of grindship. I have found that it is almost impossible for someone to disregard passion. Very rarely do people ask in a negative way, why does she care so much? Or say, man, I hate the way that that guy loves what he's doing so much. What a jerk. I have also found that those who do approach the passion of others with condescension or avarice are often those who completely lack it themselves. No one cares that you don't care. Passion runs rampant on this campus. This is easy to see on Monon Bell weekend, but for some reason, passion about sports is rarely questioned as absurd. Approaching something with passion means an unabashed and unrestrained devotion, a passion that is unchecked by the norm and often flies in the face of what is typical. Dr. Waisaki is passionate about organic chemistry. You may not think that carbon is the most exciting thing ever, but I'm here today to tell you that you're wrong. No one in our Chem 101 class thought it was weird that Dr. Waisaki loves organic chemistry. Quite the opposite, it was impossible for us not to be caring just a little bit about carbon as well. I will make the comparison to a contact high with complete seriousness. If you are around someone's passion for long enough, it starts to rub off. It is almost impossible to be immune to this infectious process and understanding how it is an incredibly powerful tool. Bring that unrestrained, genuine passion to whatever it is that you find yourself doing next and you will surpass those who doubt you and inspire those by your side. If you are Dr. Lexi Hurl, passion comes for students. A passion like this is the kind that inspires others to persevere and grow and fully embrace their own passions, even if, perhaps especially if, they're completely off the wall. There's a reason that beloved teaks are the way they are. Bringing a passion like Dr. Hurl's passion for others can have profound effects on those around you, and if you're one of Dr. Hurl's advisees, may even guide you from freshman tutorial to delivering a commencement address. It is the presence of passionate people like these that make the idea of walking under the arch such a hard one. To capture the importance of this feeling, I will borrow a quote used on occasion by both Dr. Rush and Marcus Camrath from A.A. A. Milne's beloved Winnie the Pooh, who wisely notes how lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard. I will say it again a little more slowly because that's what professors do when they say something important. <laughs> how lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard. This endearing quote certainly captures the complicated feelings of loss and gratitude most of us will feel when we cross this stage. However, it also puts our position as graduates of Wabash College in perspective. How lucky we are to be here. While I certainly use luck, meaning the chance at such a rewarding college experience, I also use it to mean good, old-fashioned, roll of the die, luck. There is a student on the south side of Indianapolis who is smarter than I am, more driven to succeed than I am, and could deliver a better commencement speech than the one I am right now. But he did not come to Wabash because his parents couldn't afford it or because he is working to support his own family. And now, with my college degree, my opportunities are far wider and far easier to access than his. Why? Because I got lucky. I got lucky to be white, I got lucky to be male, and I got lucky to be born to parents who worked hard to pay for school so that I wouldn't have to. I even got lucky that I have parents who couldn't care less that their son likes dudes. All things that give me a significant and unfair head start on my peer from the south side of Indianapolis. Now hear me out, folks. As Wabash men, we take a deep and personal pride in working for what we earn and working very hard. The diploma you will receive in a few minutes is a testament to that well-deserved achievement, something not simply handed to you, figuratively speaking. But I believe that there is something to be said about being given the opportunity to work hard here at Wabash. We do ourselves and those who have supported us and this institution a disservice if we waste this luck. So what does it look like to use this luck and opportunity? 
I will try to avoid the commencement cliches calling on you all to make a difference. Of course we all want to make a positive difference. That drives an essential reason that we are graduating today. Angelina Jolie accepted the Jean Herschel Humanitarian Award in 2013 and cited her own luck in her acceptance speech. She expressed the importance of using luck to simply be of use. Take the time to think about what you are doing and what you are contributing, who you are affecting and how. Empathize and step outside of your own view of the world. Our education here has prepared each of us to raise the bar when it comes to the way that one person treats another. We are lucky to be graduating today, but what we do from here depends entirely on whether or not we wish to be of use or to squander our luck and opportunity for mediocrity. So as you walk under the arch and prepare to take your talents off of this campus, I call on you, my Wabash brothers, to develop a passion for people and for others. Be kind, work hard, and play hard. You know what you're doing, even if it doesn't seem like it just yet. It's a beautiful day to graduate, Everybody love everybody. Thank you. Men of the class of 2016, professors, alumni, family and friends, distinguished guests. It is an honor to stand before you today, an honor, and it's a little intimidating following my friend Nathan Bodie's wonderful speech, but I'll try, to offer a few words before this newest class of Wabash men receives sheepskin and roses and begins a new chapter of its life. I want to begin today by pointing out a simple fact that our parents and professors might understand a little better than we of the millennial generation. The 21st century is not that old. Sure, it's been around for 16 of our 22 years of life, but that, of course, is not a long time. So in a way, the 21st century has hardly begun, and we know so little about the things that it will be remembered and known for in the future. Imagine judging the entire 20th century by the scientific achievements, fashions, and social values of 1916. Could the class of 1916 have predicted another world war? Or the social upheaval of the 60s or space flight? Or the internet age? I doubt it. And so why should we expect this century to be defined by the state of affairs in 2016? I, for one, would not like this century to be remembered for populist billionaires running for president. <laughs> for ISIS destroying the cultural, historical, and religious fabric of the Middle East, and for the growing threat of climate change and our apparent inability or unwillingness to prevent our own destruction. In short, we have no clue what this century will look like in 30, let alone 80 years. So while we're no longer fretting over Y2K, we do recognize that the birth pangs of this new century are barely over and a great unknown lies before us. The question is, how will this generation of Wabash men rise to face this great unknown? What can we offer, what can the liberal arts offer to this new century? First, I think we must look to our past. If Joseph Tuttle or George McIntosh could not recognize the education we receive here as fitting a liberally educated man, I'm not sure that any of this is worth it. Naturally, things change, but much should and does remain the same. We can hardly expect to confront the changes of the next hundred years if we are illiterate about our past, our histories, our narratives, the cultures and traditions that have shaped us and this college. We must be as familiar with these traditions as we are with our own hopes for the future if we are to make wise decisions in that future. The day we stop reading Homer is the day we forget how to come home from our own ten years wandering. The day we forget the story of David and Absalom is the day father strikes sword against son. The day we leave behind the Gospel of Mark is the day we forget that love of neighbor cannot be separated from love of God. And you can all surely add examples from your own disciplines, texts that if we lose, this life will be a little darker. We should not pretend that the liberal arts isn't under attack and our quick answers, efficiency-hungry, 
culture. But we also cannot forget that this great project, this Center for Classical Learning on the Indiana Frontier, was met with as much suspicion, if not more, 180 years ago than it is today. History does repeat itself. That said, we cannot let an appreciation of our past prevent us from living fully into the present. It's no good wallowing in despair, pretending that this experiment has failed. In what is perhaps the most widely read commencement address in Wabash history, Bill Plaker said in 1970, had this speech been given 10 years ago, I could have been very fashionable and tried to depress all of you. That was a time when some college students loved to attack the apparent self-satisfaction of their society and speak at great length of alienation and existential anguish. Dr. Plaker wrote these words at the height of the Vietnam War, and while our world is very much changed from that one, I challenge you to consider the similarities. Instead of beating his, head, his audience over the head with records of war crimes or the deaths of Wabash men, Dr. Plaker offered words of hope, and I propose something similar today. If the liberal arts is going to give us anything, it should be hope, and it does this every day here at Wabash. I find hope in the liberal arts because it challenges what this society thinks is important. In the face of rampant consumerism and cheap media, the liberal arts poses perennial questions through works of literature and art that we don't get to judge as great because time has proven them to be. My own personal tastes inferior. The power of the written word and its intersection in this place with science, mathematics, and social investigation is a formula that can change the world. Hear what some of our classmates said when asked about this. The liberal arts gave one man of the class of 2016 hope when reading Foucault, whom he thought he hated, reignited his intellectual fire and contributed greatly to the restoration of his sanity, as he puts it. The liberal arts did this for another when he learned to think less of what he will earn and achieve and more of what he will do for humankind. Another of our classmates said that the liberal arts has given him hope in the minds that it creates the encompassing, empathetic cognition, as he put it, that allows for analysis of all points of view beyond our own presuppositions and biases. Another finds hope in what we do here when a fraternity senior puts down his controller to help his freshman brothers take out the trash, or when a student sends class notes to his sick brother without being asked. He finds hope knowing that this band of brothers, as President White so often put it, will have his back forever. Another of your classmates finds hope that in the liberal arts, there is not one way to approach a problem. Both biology and Matthew 24 have influenced the way he thinks about climate change. Another finds hope in the beauty the liberal arts has given him, in the beauty of the highest of human achievements, literature, music, cinema, architecture, but also philosophy, theology, and even chess. This student said that narratives, symphonies, ideas, and philosophies that possess some quality about them that one may only describe as beautiful, all these are not themselves givers of hope. Rather, through these very human endeavors, we find, I think, that source of hope, which is beauty. We need the liberal arts. We need its wisdom and its guiding influence, and we are reminded of this almost every day in this place, our own academic Arcadia. At its best, this place is positively dripping with wisdom, like the honey that drips like dew from the hard oak trees in the Virgilian landscape. We see this in each other and our classmates, who are often our most profound teachers. But we also see this in our professors, old and new, young and retired, professors in this world and those in the age to come. We began this year with the funeral of Professor Stokes, a man many are lucky to have known, but most of us impoverished for not having such luck. In his homily on the occasion, Dr. Nelson spoke these words, which probably sum up the devotion to the liberal arts in this place better than anything I've ever heard. In explaining why Professor Stokes did not want the sermon to be chiefly about him, Dr. Nelson said that this is a commitment to spending more time with better texts, like the Gospels, 
and John Donne and Wallace Stevens. It comes from a sense that the best kind of life is the one that would say the highlight of the memorial service was the Mozart piece, because music peaked with Mozart and everything else is a pale reflection. As Dr. Hudson reminded us last spring in his final chapel talk, such an education means that we connect fact with value and understand our responsibilities to others as liberally educated citizens. And sometimes this results in a dark and maybe even cynical view of the world. Dr. Hudson did say that such knowledge, of course, is one of the penalties of the liberal arts education, and so too is the compassion that results from such knowledge. But he also said that it should make us infinitely hopeful. And I am hopeful when I look at this class. I'm hopeful for a world with just a little more critical thinking than it had a little more attention to beauty and a little less attention to tabloids, a little more compassion and a little less hate. And so why ultimately the liberal arts? Why this place? It's not about gaining specific skills or even a certain brand of knowledge or list of texts. As Dr. Kubiak likes to put it, the liberal arts is good for the soul. He's right. And I think for me, it's simple. In the face of a world that seems darker every day, in the face of this unknown century, what we've done here, what we will do, all of you, it gives me hope.
President, it's my honor to present Thomas J. Broker so that you might bestow upon him the honorary degree Doctor of Humane Letters. When former Vice President presidential candidate Sarah Palin stood at a lectern with an elaborately beaded jacket and endorsed Donald J. Trump at a much publicized press conference in January, America knew that Tina Fey would make a special guest appearance on Saturday Night Live to reprise her impersonation of the former, former Alaskan governor. But as the sketch came together, the designer jacket was nowhere to be found. So Tom Broker did what he has done for more than 20 years as the costume for Saturday Night Live, as the costumer for Saturday Night Live. Without a moment of drama, he improvised and had his team create a hand-beaded replica jacket just in time for Tina Fey's hilarious performance. Thomas J. Broker, welcome home to Wabash College. We are so very pleased to be able to pay tribute to you for your award-winning career as a designer for more than 550 primetime television episodes on Broadway and on Broadway for motion pictures and in theaters large and small across the country. You chose to attend Wabash because of its strong pre-med program, but quickly discovered on your own your interests were in theater and dance. You studied at Yale during your junior year and found your calling with the Yale Dramatic Association. Returning to Wabash, you commuted to Butler University where you studied theater and dance while taking a full load at Wabash and graduating with honors. You moved to New York where you interned at Juilliard working on sets and costumes. You caught on and as assistant costume designer for Saturday Night Live before earning your master's degree in set and costume design at Yale. When you returned to SNL, you were named the show's head costume designer and you have overseen the entire look of the show for more than two decades. You have become a member of SNL creator Lauren Michaels' inner circle and he praises you for, your, for truly bringing to life what writers have created. Quote, his taste and judgment are impeccable, Michael says of you. I don't know how to grow trust, how to grow to trust someone on taste and judgment, but somehow he and I got there. SNL is a 72-hour creative sprint each week as comedians and writers conceive, pitch, revive, rehearse, and perform sketches that are smart, current, and become etched into our memories. Lauren Michaels describes the process as creative chaos, but he says that you are always very calm. He says, quote, I never know what's going on inside of Tom, but he is always calm and never complains. Even when he has to get 30 people in medieval garb during a commercial break into costume, he's the consummate pro. Even when guest hosts bring an entourage of stylists, you always find a way to make that person look better. In a business with more than its fair share of prima donnas, you are, as Michael says, always the adult in the room. Away from Saturday Night Live, for which you've, for which you've won a primetime Emmy Award, you costumed over 100 episodes of Tina Fey's comedy, 30 Rock, on which you have a recurring role as Lee, the scene it all, frequently exasperated, but still unflappable, costumer of the show within a show. Miss Fay says, Tom Broker knows my body better than I do. <laughs> we'll discuss later. <laughs> you have said, as a costume designer, my job is to reinforce the story and to help the actor form an identity of their character. That was never more true than the first season of House of Cards, for which you not only created the fashion identity of the First Lady Claire, but also set off an iconic look that captivated women in and outside the DC Beltway. Your work on House of Cards earned you a prestigious Costume Designer Guild Award in 2014, the same year and category in which you were nominated for SNL. 
You have design for theatrical productions, large and small, on and off Broadway, and created the costumes for the Tony Award winning Smash Sidemen. And since you were only burning 120 of your available 168 hours each week, you convinced Lorne Michaels to let you produce a documentary timed with the 40th anniversary of Saturday Night Live. The results, live from New York, was an intimate, behind the scenes look at the show from its very beginnings, which thrilled Michaels, who said, there are very few people I would trust and know that however it turns out, I'm going to like it. But that's the way I feel about Tom. He's just so much a part of the fabric of the show. He's the heart and soul of it. Thomas J. Broker, for so passionately pursuing your craft at the highest levels of television, film, and stage, and for being the adult in the room every Saturday night, every Saturday night for more than two decades, your alma mater salutes you. Therefore, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Wabash College and delegated to that board by the great state of Indiana, I do hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereunto appertaining, of which this citation shall be a permanent witness. My honor to present Congresswoman Susan W. Brooks so that you might bestow on her the honorary degree, Doctor of Humane Letters. Thank you. Congresswoman Susan W. Brooks, we are honored by your presence and proud to lift you up on this day as a model of civic leadership. A native of Fort Wayne, you graduated from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio before returning to the Hoosier State for your law degree at the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. You have been drawn to public service throughout your lifetime and have devoted the bulk of your career to strengthening the city of Indianapolis and the state of Indiana. You spent 13 years in private law practice with Ice Miller and as a criminal defense attorney at McClure, McClure, and Cayman. Later in your service to Indianapolis as Mayor Steve Goldsmith's, Goldsmith's deputy, you focused on public safety issues, working tirelessly to improve police, fire, and emergency response efforts, as well as the criminal justice and social welfare systems. Your board memberships reflected your commitment to making central Indiana a better, safer place to live. Marion County Community Corrections, Indianapolis Violence Reduction Partnership, Race Relations Leadership Network Committee, and the Employers Against Domestic Violence Initiative, to name just a few. So impressive was your work as Deputy Mayor that you were named the Indianapolis Business Journal's 40 Under 40 list and received recognition as the Influential Woman of Indianapolis in 1999. Indeed, there are scores of Wabash alumni who sing your praises and not just your husband, David, a member of the class of 1977. Mayor Goldsmith, class of 1968, says, quote, you blended a strong commitment to public service with an inclusive style that produced consensus on important and often highly divisive issues. He says you made Indianapolis a better and safer place with your ability to take individuals and groups with quite inconsistent positions and get them to work towards a safer and more just city. After your service to Indianapolis, President George W. Bush appointed you as the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Indiana. Of Indiana. Your investigations and prosecutions were wide-ranging and included gun violence, child exploitation, 
identity theft in the, in the age of, of the Internet, and drug trafficking, including a significant case against a prominent physician for illegally prescribing OxyContin. After serving as Senior Vice President of Workforce and Economic Development and General Counsel of Ivy Tech Community College, you sought a greater challenge when you won election to the U.S. House of Representatives, re Representatives for the 5th Congressional District. In doing so, you became just the second Republican woman elected to Congress from Indiana, which prompted your fellow congressman, Luke Messer, class of 1991, to describe you as a, quote, trailblazing Hoosier leader who has dedicated her career to public service. Congressman Messer says that you are smart, always prepared, hardworking, and a role model to countless young women, including my own two daughters. Your experience as an attorney in private practice, deputy mayor, and U.S. attorney equipped you with instant credibility in Congress in critical areas such as public safety, economic development, homeland security, and counterterrorism. Today you serve on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the House Ethics Committee, and the Select Committee on the events surrounding the 2012 terrorist attack in Benghazi. And we note that your bipartisan efforts helped end the October 2013 government shutdown, which earned the respect of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle. In 2014, you sailed to victory in both the hotly contested primary and in the general election when you earned 65% of the vote. You are an effective congressional leader because, as your chief of staff, Megan Savage, says, you are a masterful consensus builder. You arrive at decisions through genuine kindness and respect for others' opinions. You are able to connect what's happening in Indiana with the work of Congress. Today, you are bringing together judges, probation officers, prosecutors, pharmacists, doctors, and lawmakers, all of the stakeholders, to get them talking so that they understand that heroin ab abuse is an epidemic health care issue. Your chief of staff tells us that you are very comfortable with the decisions you make because you have solicited the ideas and feedback from so many people engaged in the issues. Indeed, Ms. Savage describes you as the greatest connector of people she has ever met. Our very own Bob Grant, class of 1978, describes you as an extraordinary public servant with high intellect and, above all, impeccable integrity. You are also keep your family connected. Even though your children, Jessica and Connor, are adults, you and David still enjoy riding horses together with them and going on family vacations. All of us at Wabash admire your leadership in Congress, your commitment to your constituents, and your commitment to live your values each and every day. Therefore, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Wabash College and delegated to that board by the great state of Indiana, I do hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities therein thereunto appertaining, of which this citation shall be a permanent witness. Gentlemen of the Wabash Class of 2016, you have fulfilled the requirements of graduation from our great college. You have persevered in difficult times and shined brightly in all aspects of your endeavors. You have made all of us who have taught, mentored, and guided you very, very proud. 
Therefore, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Wabash College and delegated to that board by the great state of Indiana, I do hereby confer upon you the Bachelor of Arts degree with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereunto appertaining. Now it is my, please, everyone. <laughs> Now it is my distinct honor to invite you to come forward to be honored as graduates of our great college. Thomas Anzalone. <laughs> Elias Eder Ariano Villanueva. And DeAndre Artis Jr. Kendall Grant Baker. Zechariah Lee Banks. Hugh Jacob Barkley. Christopher Joseph Bearer. Christian Dakota Beardsley. John Arthur Belford. Grant William Benefield. Sean Page Samuel Best in absentia. Jonathan Eric Bojrab. Daniel Alexander Bowes. Craig Patrick Brainerd. Chase Alexander Bramlett. Andrew Reed Bruckman. Christopher Thomas Broker. Wesley Joseph Brown. Alan Camacho. Ty Timothy Campbell. Saul Cardiel.
Robert Michael Carter. Sean Maurice Cavanaugh. Jacob Dylan Cooper. Jordan Hunter Culp. Christopher Rome Dabs the second. Ethan Martin Davies. Daniel Delgado. James Gabriel DeFecchio. Matthew John Dickerson, Jr. Kenneth Deshaun Dillon. Brian Michael Elliott in absentia. Kyle Edward Ennis. Tyrone Ivan Evans, Jr. <laughs> Benjamin Charles Farmer. James Raymond Fritz, the third. Nicholas Graham Fry. Thomas Wayne Garrity. Methuselah K. G. Matthew Carl Gibson. Arturo Enrique Granado Sestrada. Sean Patrick Grannon. Justin Michael Green. Zachary Nathaniel Green. Weston Van Gregg. Jordan Kelly Grooms. Seth Thomas Gunderman.
Timothy C. Hansen. Sharif Anthony Harrison. Spencer Dayton Harrison. Brian Zachary Hayhurst. Samuel Raymond Heidorn. Alexander Hernandez. Clayton Michael Hyam. Addison James Hummel. Robert Edward Sakani Johnson. Truman Jacob Jones. Marcus J. Camrath. William Connor Carnes. James Leo Kennedy the fourth. Eric Nicholas Kyle. Bryce Michael Killian. Tuan Ayn Lee in absentia. Connor Eugene Lefevre. Reese Matthew Lefevre. Terry Devon Majors. Tucker D. Mark. Samuel Sebastian Mattingly. Tyler Allen McCullen. Sean P. McGrath. Kurt Harrison Miller. Taylor Anthony Miller. Jeremy Robert Minor. Raymond Wayne Oakley Monroe.
Jack Brooks Montgomery. Jacob Davenport Mull. Joseph Dylan Murphy. Austin T. Myers. Mark Joseph Myers. Trong Xuan Nguyen in absentia. David Allen Nolan III in absentia. Nelson Isaac Novak. Darian Rovon Nunn. David Michael Oliger. Aaron Wilhelm Peterson. Brent Michael Poling. Michael Bowden Putko. Clayton Cole Randolph. Graham Anthony Joseph Redwick. Mitchell Allen Reeves. Charles Aaron Ridgeway. Evan Robert Rudder. Jared Robert Santana. James Richard Schaefer. Anthony D. Sheets. Bauer Weston Schmelz. Sean Walter Scully. Clayton James Foster Surveys. Mitchell Nash Singleton. Joshua James Smith.
Michael Lee Smith. Ross Wilson Sponsler. Willie D. Strong, Jr. Andrew Cormack, Sunday. Ian Spencer, Sunday. Joshua Aaron Tapper. Jake Adam Thompson. Michael B. Thompson in absentia. Brent William Tom. Tyler Todd Trepton. Michael Anthony Venezia. Christian Alexander Vukas. Adam Wesley Wadlington. Quentin James Watson. Donovan Cameron Whitney. Christopher Brian Whitman. Brandon Lee Wong Namnet, the second. Justin Garrett Woods. Jason Craig Wright. Chase Aaron Young. Jonathan James Lee Young. <laughs> Keith John Zelenica. Yiwan Zhou in absentia. Christopher Ray Beal, cum laude. Joshua Thomas Bleach, cum laude.
Nathaniel Brighton Bodie, cum laude. Edward David Smayhill, cum laude. Daniel Reinhold Craig, cum laude. Noah Matthew Epler, cum laude. Timothy Michael Hafner, cum laude. Samuel Dean Hainus, cum laude. Fabian Michael House, cum laude. Nash Michael Jones, cum laude. Brendan Todd King, cum laude. <laughs> Levi Matthew Kinney, cum laude. <laughs> Ivan Sergeyevich Kutsapatri, cum laude. Congratulations, Ivan. <laughs> Timothy Locksmith. Cum laude. Christian Mark Lopak, cum laude. Christopher Robert McGew, cum laude. Michael Thomas Miller, cum laude. Anthony Julian Milto, cum laude. Eric Michael Need, cum laude. Han Nye, cum laude. Jacob Richard Norley, cum laude. Stephen Anthony Peters, cum laude. Joshua Lee Piercy, cum laude. Richard Tyler Rene, cum laude. Cameron Michael Stepler, cum laude. Gerald Franklin Taylor, cum laude, in absentia. Adam Ken Togami, cum laude.
Tron An Tung, cum laude. Nam Vo, cum laude. Xiong Ya Yen, cum laude, in absentia. Thomas Charles Bleach, magna cum laude. Patrick Frankoviak Bryant, magna cum laude. Austin Scott Burton, magna cum laude. Cole Alexander Chapman, magna cum laude. Alfred J. Clark, magna cum laude. Jonathan Edward Darone, magna cum laude. Hey, congratulations, <laughs> Ethan Paul Farmer, magna cum laude. Travis Michael Flock, magna cum laude. Brock Alexander Arnett Hammond, magna cum laude. USA He, magna cum laude. <laughs> Elliot Matthew Johns, magna cum laude. Charles George Mavros, magna cum laude. Dylan Martin Miller, magna cum laude. Nicholas James Minato, magna cum laude. Tyler James Mungus, magna cum laude. Scott Michael Perucker, magna cum laude. Daniel Raymond Giannis Pervlesis, magna cum laude. Wejia She, magna cum laude, in absentia. Christopher Colin Schrack, magna cum laude. Paul Justice Snyder, magna cum laude.
Brett Michael Thumb, magna cum laude. Brian E. Tipman, magna cum laude. Xinyan Xuan, magna cum laude. Hao Peng Yen, magna cum laude. Mason Nicholas Zurich, magna cum laude. Adam Matthew Alexander, summa cum laude. Derek Miller Andre, summa cum laude. Matthew Daniel Binder, summa cum laude. Robert Cameron Dennis, summa cum laude. Lester Maxwell Adams Gallivan, summa cum laude. Abraham Crawford Hall, summa cum laude, in absentia. Kevin Andrew Kennedy, Jr., summa cum laude. Inboom Lee, summa cum laude. Albert Yuehin Lee, summa cum laude. Joshi Lu, summa cum laude. Caleb Alexander Morris, summa cum laude. Benjamin Jacob Shank, summa cum laude. Christopher John Stazinski, summa cum laude. Samuel Thomas Vaught, summa cum laude. Alexander Michael Waters, summa cum laude. Corbin Hong James West, summa cum laude.
To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Endings are never easy. Thankfully, that's not why we're here. The traditional time of commencement is the springtime, just as new plantings are taking root and as new plans are coming together. Spring is a time to celebrate renewal and the future. Usually it's a bit warmer, but today we're just gonna have to make do. This is just one of those additional character building opportunities we give you at Wabash College. Surprisingly, this time of commencement seems to sidestep the inconvenient issue that we are marrying the end of one aspect of your life with the beginning of a new one. And in this blending of the new and the old, in this connection between the yesterdays and tomorrows, just for today, the tomorrows win. Be assured, gentlemen, that your Wabash education has provided you with the simple gifts you need to find your way into your new tomorrows, to make good and to do good, to find meaning and purpose in life and to celebrate it, not just to be men, but to be good men. Your liberal arts education has equipped you to act, to see, and to speak. We taught you the tools of education, to think critically, to read and write clearly, to solve and reflect and to immerse yourselves in your surroundings and your inner lives, and to help you identify your authentic selves. We gave you the keen eye of a Wabash education so that you might see diverse points of view and to be challenged by them, augmenting your own point of view and leaving you changed but undisturbed. We coaxed you to write your own story, to live up to the gentleman's rule, and to think, act, lead, and live. And you have written glorious chapters in the history of our great college. Your efforts on stage, in the classroom, and on the athletic field have earned you national rankings and brought honor to your alma mater. We will remember your achievements and because of you, Wabash is a better college, better college than it was when you arrived here just four years ago. Although I did not have the pleasure of bringing you into Wabash, the charge I make to incoming freshmen focuses on what I call the forgets, not to forget about college. To get to work, to get involved, to get some sleep, and to get help. Mostly you handled those four gets pretty well, although sleep was probably seriously shortchanged along the way. And don't forget that those four gets also apply to your life outside of college. As you leave, however, I want you to think about the four gives, not just the four gets. The first one is to give thanks. You have mothers and fathers brothers and sisters, spouses, partners, and friends who are all here for you today. They are here to celebrate you. Don't forget throughout your life to celebrate them and to give them thanks for all those people who surround you. I now ask the class of 2016 to rise and to give a warm round of applause to your families. See them all. Now the first give, you may be seated. The second give after giving thanks is to give back. 427 of this year was what we call our one day of giving. A day when we celebrate philanthropy of alumni and friends who support our college. These generous people support you because someone else supported most if not all of their education. That's how one generation passes the torch to the next. But here's the secret. Life is not just about one day of giving. It's about every day of giving. So give back to the people that mean the most to you each and every day.
of course, sometimes it's not about giving it back. It's about giving it forward. That's the third give that I want you to remember. If you only pay back those you owe, life can become a little too closed and a little too narrow. Be generous to those who are standing outside your circle and bring them into your circle. Expand your notion of self-interest and you will see your world grow in ways you could never imagine possible. The final give, Wabash men, is to give notice. Wabash men, you have arrived. You are smart, directed, passionate, and compassionate. You have swagger. Don't lose it. Don't ever lose it. Make Wabash Always Fights become your mantra for life. Be very bold. You have everything the Scarecrow, Tin Man, and the Lion were looking for. You have brains, you have heart, and you have courage. And you also have what Dorothy was searching for all along. Always know that Wabash College is your home. There will never be a place like it in your entire life, ever. Gentlemen, in the class of 2016, please rise. Wabash Men, the class of 2016, it is my honor and privilege to be with you here, to have taken part in your joys and sorrows, hopes and dreams, victories and defeats, to have shared your life with you, and to witness your shared life with one another. Know that ultimately, the greatest education and the greatest gift we gave you here at the college was each other. And you will need that gift because while your future will be graced with moments of unspeakable joy and beauty, it will also be tested by sorrow and painful moments. Be strong and seek strength from each other. You have been and will continue to be each other's epistles, which you take into your futures and which can never be taken away. Now, go forth, gentlemen of Wabash, and leave this place with pride in your, in your accomplishments and confidence that you will make a difference in this world and be good, very good, Wabash men. Sea, our scarlet banner go. The 
honors one life's loyal son and highest rich on state her. Forevermore, as in days of yore, their deeds be noble and grand. Then once again, you Wabash men, three cheers for Alma Mater. Whatever be fall, revered by all, may she unequal stand. Our prayers are always there, so I the hearts of us to find to sing that praise and preacher day shall be a name before us. When all the days are past, and all the lives shall last, the greatest joy will be to shout the chorus. Dear old Wabash, thy loyal sons shall ever love thee, and o'er the classic halls thy soul's scarlet flag shall proudly flash. Long in our hearts, in our hearts will bear the sweetest memories of thee. Long shall we sing thy praises, O. Let us pray. We give thanks for all that we have seen and all that we have heard and all that we have felt. We give thanks for all of the accomplishments of this class of young men who will go boldly into the world dreaming of peace, who will go boldly into the world dreaming of justice, who will go boldly into the world dreaming of a world full of unity and hope, and hope that is beyond measure. And they will be forever thankful for the accidents of their birth, yea, even the luck of their parenting, the luck of this college in the faith of its mission. Let it be forever spread upon the world that Wabash is here to serve the wants of the nation and the global community unflinchingly and unnervingly forever and ever. And even as we prepare to depart this place, these hollow lands, we ask that the grace of the Almighty, the matchless security of the eternal, build a hedge around each and every one of us as we journey to our destinations. And may we find our places secure and untouched. And may the lives that we continue to leave, live, be worthy of all that is given to us. In the matchless name of that which is the most sacred, the most beautiful, and the most honored, we pray. Amen.